Welcome guys to the Macros Bodybuilding and Powerlifting Podcast. I'm your host Steve Hall and I have another exciting guest for you guys today and that is Mike Vacanti. So I think a lot of you may have heard of Mike, uh, some of you might not have so there'd be a real mix and sure the personal trainers who listen to the podcast, the coaches definitely will have um, because we've been keeping eyes on like social media and Gary V's all over the place so we'll have seen Mike and probably Jordan Syat now as well. Um, so to give you a bit of background about Mike, um, I actually was really interested to hear how you quit accounting in 2012 and then just kind of didn't know what you wanted to do and you just kind of left and you're like, oh, go into fitness and we'll delve more into that. But um, right now, Mike is an entrepreneur, personal trainer, writer, online fitness coach and founder of On The Regiment, um, has some fantastic blogs on that website if I must say myself because obviously I've got my own blog um, but I definitely look up to these ones that, like you're featured in the personal training development center a lot of the time um, and other people's kind of best lists um, so it's definitely someone I, I aspire to your writing um, and also was a former intern for John Romanello who again I'm sure a lot of the listeners will have heard of a great writer in himself and then, of course, uh, personal trainer to Gary Vee um, for, a, was it two or three years? Um, two years, yeah. Yep. Two years. So that's, that's crazy in itself. Um, obviously, all over Snapchat, on YouTube, Instagram, mm -hmm. all over the socials, um, and uses, and actually recently released on the Regimen, uh, which is a tracking app as well, similar to My Fitness Pal. Yep, yep. So exactly. yeah, people might have found that. Um, so yeah, that's in a roundabout way who Mike is, uh, where you might have heard about him because I'm sure you might have kind of heard the name, might be familiar, but we not, might not be fully sure. Um, and yeah, just if there's anything else you want to add, Mike, I know you're saying you take your training more seriously now. You're kind of, I know you're similar to myself in that kind of building muscle isn't like something that comes easy to you. And I know watching your snaps kind of when you're trying to gain muscle, it's like a fighting battle to get in the food and things like that. So yeah, a little yep. bit of background that you kind of want to add. For sure. For sure. That was an awesome intro. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you covered most of it. I'm, <laughs> I'm a strength coach. I live in New York. I put content on the internet that is surround like around fitness stuff, trying to help people. Um, yeah, I mean, we can start from the beginning. We can talk about the transition from corporate America into fitness stuff, uh, wherever you want to take it, wherever, like you think people want to hear and where we can add value. I think what would be really interesting, at least for me, and I think for a lot of people, cause a lot of people find it interesting, kind of, they ask me, how did you get where you are now? Because I was similar to yourself. I kind of had a corporate job and I left it and just, I knew I wanted to go into personal training, whereas you didn't. But 2012 wasn't that long ago and you're already where you are today, which is where a lot of kind of personal trainers who have been in the industry, maybe 10, 15 years aspire to be or younger personal trainers who are just coming into the industry definitely want to get towards. So, yeah, I'd be yeah. interested to just hear that journey and kind of I know you were interned by John Romanello and kind of the influences he hopefully, well, things he helped you with and how that expanded Absolutely. your kind of journey so yeah go go right from the start kind of where how it built up to where it is now for sure for sure so where like like fitness was always the number one thing in my life from the age of 13 14 years old I remember specifically getting cut from a hockey team in eighth grade and and knowing that there's one avenue to getting better and that's through work that's through strength training and plyos and paying attention to training and like like that's the controllable factor um, combined with adolescence, girls, like wanting to be leaner, have muscle look better for those reasons. So entering high school was the, the official start of the journey, you could call it. Um, and we can kind of fast forward through a lot of that. Uh, but I, I saw you recently had Lyle McDonald on here who oh, yeah. was like my introduction to actually good fitness nutrition advice um so from like age 15 until college basically it was men's health men's fitness try this workout try this eat only tuna diet like yeah. like all that stuff and and it worked like not super efficiently but it took me from skinny fat to now i have abs to like now i have a little bit of muscle um but yeah in uh like 2007, my sophomore year of college, 
was when I stumbled across bodyrecomposition.com and just devoured like every piece of the site of the forum. Like it, it was just this whole new world that I was infatuated with. And, uh, and that was, I guess like the start of me taking fitness stuff more seriously because I got into the business school. I was an accounting major, which was like a smart, safe thing. We're coming up on the, the 2008 recession. And it was like, if you always want a job, if you always want money, if you want security, like this is a good thing to do. And so my first couple of years, I had nutritional science classes as um, like the science prerequisites for getting into the business school. And I loved them. Like that's where I that's where I originally learned about macronutrients and like four four nine to come up with calories and and like combining that with body recomp was just like this is awesome. I love this, but it never seemed practical. Mm -hmm. it, I, I could never see myself like majoring in a field in the sciences. And so I got my accounting degree, which I I enjoyed. Like I liked accounting classes. I liked business classes. Um, but post college, when I started working in the corporate atmosphere, that culture, uh, very, very stuffy, very, um, it just wasn't me. It wasn't something I liked from the get go. I kind of knew that like this type of work is not how I want to spend the next 30, 40, 50 years of my life. Mm -hmm. and so basically from the time I took my corporate job post-college, I was planning my escape from that. And yeah, like like you mentioned previously, I didn't know that that meant start a blog, start training clients in person, like do fitness specific stuff. Um, but I just knew I had to get away from what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And so in those two years, I worked a job for two years, saved up enough money so that I had enough runway yeah. to quit. And like, because because money, money is important in that it's freedom and it's time and it's like life burn rate. So yeah. uh, I had myself in a position to take a two year shot at something. If I only spend some ridiculously low number, like $900 a month or, or something um, on total expenses for my whole life, I can like take a shot at anything I want. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and yeah, the, the idea for on the regimen, which has morphed many times since its onset um, was, was the first thing I tried and started writing Got a blog put up probably six or seven months, eight months after I officially quit my job, and uh, yeah, that was that was the transition. That's it is. I mean, to me, it's crazy because it sounds like me, but over in America because I had very much the, a similar journey. Kind of, I went, I found Lyle McDonald. He was the first person I found. I went in. I love business and like economics, and I went into doing uh, merchandising. And then I kind of did a similar thing to you, kind of, I, I took a risk. I was living at home, so it wasn't so much of a risk, but I was doing kind of personal training on the side, a online course, because I was mm -hmm. like, maybe I'll do it. But like yourself, I was like, it's maybe not practical. It's risky. The money you can earn isn't that much. Whereas like accountancy, you can earn big, big amounts and like merchandise. Yeah, I could have potentially earned quite a lot. And I think a lot of personal trainers, or I hope the personal trainers who get it into it, like that I feel like they're like you and me are very passionate about actual personal training actually helping people whereas there's a lot of personal trainers who kind of start from like maybe they don't go to college maybe they drop out from school early and they get into it as kind of like oh personal training is like an easy way in um, I just want to be an online coach because that seems like a cushy lifestyle versus I really like this stuff I'm obsessed with yeah. it yeah yeah absolutely yeah. So I think that that gives a lot of background about who you are and like what you're about, because not only does it show that you're really, really passionate about helping people about fitness and all of these things, but that you're hardworking and like a risk taker to a degree, which I think when we talk about things later, kind of about how personal trainers can stand out and things like this, I think that's something you've done, kind of maybe taken risks and kind of pushed the boat a little bit. Um, Thank you. It sounds on, like you want to go on that it. subject. The subject of money, though, I can't drive that home hard enough because when so starting salary in Minnesota at a big four accounting firm where I was working as a 22 year old was forty nine thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars. And I distinctly remember 
because that was like more than enough. I'm, I'm not fancy. I'm not luxurious. Like I don't need stuff. I'm wearing a, a $2 white t-shirt that I bought in a big pack of six. Um, I remember when I quit thinking if I can just make $15,000 a year, like if I can make 15 K doing something I like, like I'm going to be so happy. I'm going to yeah. be so pumped. And that was what was in my mind was it was never about money. It was about just not doing what I'm doing now, mm-hmm. which, uh, yeah, I, I, I see people who I get a lot of DMS. I get a lot of questions from people who are personal trainers and want to move businesses online and people who just, Hey, I like fitness too. How can I do that? Because I want to travel the world and sit on my laptop and only work one hour a day and like stack the cash. It's like that just doesn't happen like that. Yeah, it doesn't. I mean, if anyone, like, we had to reschedule this, and when we were starting up, you were, like, obviously busy, and, like, not. I'm not trying to call you out or say that was bad. It's, like, yeah. it's just that's how your lifestyle is, and it's, like, we have to shuffle things around. It's not as kind of cushy, and, like, obviously, we have a degree of control of our time than other compared to other jobs, and, like, I have the luxury of being able to go to the gym twice a day at the moment because I can schedule my time, but I'm still working a lot of hours and putting in the grind as it were um but yeah well, let's kind of move back and i want to talk about kind of your experience with john romanello because mm-hmm. he is a kind of prolific writer he mm. is a really interesting guy in himself i've not actually ever spoke to him may well try and get him on the podcast at some point but kind of what did how did you even first of all get to be uh, an intern for him and then how did that relationship develop so I was living in Brett Lundberg's like closet ish room in Chicago, Illinois. One of my good friends uh, that I grew up with for some insanely cheap rent. And I had launched my blog a month prior, maybe like six weeks and scrolling through Facebook. Obviously I followed Roman and like a lot of big fitness people. Um, and he posted he was launching Engineering the Alpha, which went on to become New York Times bestseller, mm-hmm. but it was like during book launch. And he posted on his Facebook, RFS, Roman Fitness Systems, is looking for an intern. Here are the requirements. Must be of a certain age. Must uh, have a passion for fitness. Must be willing to work hard. Must love dogs. Must be local to New York City. And so from my apartment there, or Brett's apartment in Chicago, I replied, I left a comment, I hit up his contact form on his site, I found his assistant's email and I emailed her and just kind of like, hey, I'm the guy, I can do this. And in my mind, I was like, I'll just move there if I get it because I would do that. Mm -hmm. And um, the next day, his assistant, Anna, reached out to me and said, cool, this is at like 1 p.m. on a random Tuesday. Cool, hey Mike, you have an interview, 8 a.m., so-and-so Starbucks in the West Village, see you there. And so I I called my dad first and okay. then um, literally booked a one-way flight, threw clothes in a bag, put a suit on. So I was like, I don't know what to wear. I'm just going to like overdress <laughs> and flew out there, interviewed, uh, got the position and was fortunate enough to have a friend who I went to college with living in Harlem who's like, you can crash on my couch as long as you need to and yeah, it, it just stuck. Um, but the, the things I learned, like one of the biggest things was um, not validation, but empowerment of having this like titan of industry who I really looked up to uh, watch me work day in, day out, week in, week out, and give me a little bit more responsibility. Going from mailing international copies of the book out to um, like helping him move out of his apartment to, Hey, I have this client who needs a new meal plan. Here are the macros. Here are their food sensitivities. Can you put something together for me? And I'm going to review it. And like doing that and spending like six hours on this one meal plan, this one day of eating and him being like, this is really, really fucking good. And like how that made me feel. And, and, um, yeah, just the, the confidence and self-assurance through working under him. Mm-hmm. And then there's there's the other side, which was I saw the back end of his business. I saw how the customer service side of things worked. Uh, I was like helping lead the customer service side of things and in the, the support email for six or nine months and getting to see the types of inquiries that come in, um, like product sales, coaching sales. Like I just got to see the back end 
this is in the two to three months after I launched my site. So that combined with his leadership and mentorship and approval, um, yeah, it was just, just huge. I think that's, I mean, the, f- the first thing I thought about there was I was kind of putting myself in your shoes in if I got that kind of like out of the blue, kind of out of the blue, the email saying you've got an interview like very shortly and you have to take a flight and go and like actually commit to this. I think there'd be so many people in that position would just be like, not doing it. Like that's too much. Like it's too soon. I, they'd be I, fine I, excuses. I already know that because I have been on the other side of that coin and had people hit me up dozens of people i'd be so in for this if i lived in new york it's like then you don't really want it because there's a lot of apartments here for rent and like you could be here um yeah i think that in itself again it shows uh, like your character and what you're about and i also liked how you developed upon and i found this with kind of probably with mike isretel quite a lot um, I don't know if you know him, but he's kind mm-hmm. of like, obviously a very smart guy. And he's really, I brought him over to the UK last year. He's coming again this year. Um, and I've developed a relationship with him and just like him reading some of my articles and giving me validation, it give, like the confidence that break like gives you is just insane. And I think that's what a lot of personal trainers lack is that confidence to like mm-hmm. share value. Like there could be, I'm sure there's tons of smart personal trainers who really care and they have lots to share, but they don't want to. Um, have you kind of ever felt that you're yourself? Do you ever feel that nowadays? Like how do you kind of tackle that element? So just kind of big picture self doubt, not thinking you're good enough how to tackle that. Yeah, man, I, I still absolutely deal with it. Um, you just, (laughs) you do it right. Like you set aside the negative thoughts and the fears and the what ifs. Because those, like the anxiousness about what could happen, is always worse than what actually happens. Like if you write an article that you're scared to hit publish on, and you hit publish on, the absolute worst thing that happens is people comment and say this is shit. Like, and it's okay. And maybe you can learn from some of those comments and make adjustments and move forward. Um, but the, the reality is never as bad as fears and thoughts mm-hmm. are. And so getting in the habit of doing things and then adjusting and then doing the next thing and then adjusting and being okay with content articles, whatever being imperfect, but still posting, still publishing, still uploading a video, even though it's not shot in 4k on a fancy camera, it's just shot on your iPhone and uploaded directly to YouTube without any editing and without an intro and an outro. People can still use that information. They're still going to find it entertaining, valuable. Like there's an audience for that, but you're not going to get there unless you do it. Mm-hmm. So I, I find that thinking my way out of self-doubt never works. But doing my way out of self-doubt does. You develop mm-hmm. momentum. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, – and the point I really took away from that, and I found that myself with my writing, is the perfection element. Like a lot of people – don't want to like they want to reference every single kind of little bit of their article and then and i remember doing it and it ended up just that like sounding like a textbook basically it was like it's got nothing about like not got my voice like it's just so boring no one would want to read it yeah yeah so but that's but that's what you feel like you have to do especially when getting started for it to be done proper or correct mm mm-hmm and I guess actually leading on to this, and we wanted to talk about um, Gary V and kind of lessons from him and how that then developed. And actually, if you talk about initially, how did you kind of, it, did John introduce you to Gary? That's what I think I remember happening. Yep. How did that go? Yeah, I was fortunate enough that, so Roman got married um, probably nine months into my internship and shortly after his wedding, moved across the country from New York to Los Angeles. Uh, a couple months later, Gary bumped into Roman, who was his previous personal trainer mm-hmm. at a, a book launch party. I don't remember exactly what it was, but Gary was like, John, I need you back. I need to get back in shape. And Roman was like, well, I'm in Los Angeles now, but my right hand guy, Mike would be awesome for you. And so at this time, when I moved to New York city, I started interning for Roman right away. And within another six weeks, 
got a job on the Upper East Side training clients in person cool. at a, a little like boutique studio that does one-on-one -on -one and small group training called Structure Personal Fitness. And so I was interning with Roman, doing my own writing, training clients in person, like 30 sessions a week and just kind of throwing all the spaghetti at the wall to see what stuck. Mm -hmm. um, what Gary became was like a once a week client who kind of canceled 50% of the time and was fairly flaky. Like, like a lot of personal trainers listening, you know, like you just have some, and depending on the, on the setup in New York city, independent trainers spend a lot of time running around the city from gym to gym, uh, especially depending on the client. So there would be mornings where I would make the trek to the Upper East Side and Gary would cancel that morning because he needed another hour of sleep or whatever the case may be. Yeah. That was my initial intro was straight through Roman who gave it to me. Um, probably five months after that with Gary of like <laughs> kind of half ass we'll call it, he came to me with this idea that I'm making a change. I'm 38 years old right now. I want a full-time health and fitness coach, like seven days a week training, follow me on all my business trips, family vacations, go wherever I go, come to the office. If there's donuts in the office, make sure I don't eat them. Like a baby, a babysitter <laughs> yeah. for fitness. He's like, because nothing else has worked for me. And he asked me if I knew anyone for the position. I was like, uh, yeah, I do. Let's start tomorrow. I'm in. Uh, just knowing, you know, him, how good of a dude he is, the business mentorship opportunity that came along with it, the, the salary, which provided security as I continued to work to grow my online business. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, that was a no brainer. It was his decision. And I was happened to be the guy who was kind of training him when he decided he wanted to do this. Cool. Yeah. That's, I mean, again, it's one of those situations where you obviously, you, pushed for the position you could have been again it's one of those kind of fight or flight situations where some people would have been like they would have been scared of potentially having to take on someone like gary who is also a big character and then having to essentially let your life be in control like obviously you're in control of him to a degree but he's very yeah. much in control of you you have to go around with him around the world or wherever it may be he i mean you're kind of summoned by him so again it's you took it like you took the ball by the horns again which is really good to see I appreciate that. It's hard for me to take any credit there because of how great an opportunity it was. Like the downside, I mean, I guess to, to back up, this was 2014. It was a two year deal. Uh, his new trainer, Jordan, they're almost a year in now. So this was three years ago. And Gary wasn't the, like, he's basically famous now. Yeah. Millions of followers across platforms. Um, at the time, it was like, 50,000 on Instagram and like he was a big deal and in the tech community and like internet celebrity type thing and tons of, of notoriety from being associated with him but it's not quite like it is now mm -hmm. um yeah I guess if 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 I were married if I had children if I couldn't be in a position where I could travel with him like that was the the luxury for me was I'm a single dude my biggest priority right now in my life at the age of 26, 27, is building my business. Mm -hmm. And this is going to help me get there. What am I going to have to sacrifice? Maybe a few extra hours of sleep a night and like giving up some flexibility? No brainer. Mm -hmm. uh, so I appreciate you saying I took the bull by the horns, but it was more like can't pass up. No, yeah, I appreciate that. I, but I still think, I, I definitely can feel some people would be like, ah, oh, not sure about that. But yeah, it's, it was a fantastic, well, obviously it was fantastic and for yourself it's paid off big time. And then in terms of, obviously, I think you probably would have developed loads of personal training skills having to be one-on-one -on -one with someone. But in terms of actual business skills, what kind of, what things did you pick up from Gary? Just kind of being around him, kind of what were the biggest kind of takeaways for yourself? so many man like <laughs> um and it changes right like it it changes over time based on where i am in my life now and where my focus and priorities are when i first started so call it day one to day 30 this was before daily v there was no vlogging you know he he was the hustle guy but like what does that really mean before it was being documented? Mm -hmm. I was in the back end of his calendar and had access to 6 a.m. until midnight, straight booked all the way through Monday through Friday, 
nonstop. Um, so the, the first lesson was none of us are working as hard. Like comparing myself to him is, is a separate lesson, but that's not what I'm saying. It's the, the self auditing of, I think I'm working hard. Yeah. I see this guy going 18 straight hours. Let me actually look at how my day looks. Oh, watching YouTube videos here, like screwing around here, messing around on dating apps here. Like there are a lot of chunks of time, 15, 30, 60 minutes that add up throughout the day. So uh, that like honest self-assessment about output. Um, business lessons like his book, The Thank You Economy, which if I had to summarize it in two sentences would be uh, scale the unscalable with community meaning reply to every message, reply to every DM, help every person as much as you can for free, mm -hmm. constantly. That, for anyone who isn't where they want to be with their business, especially in a solopreneurship type setup, when you have time, right? If you're running out of time and you don't necessarily want to grow your business, maybe it makes less sense. But if you have time and you're looking to get more coaching clients, more online coaching clients, more of a following, Doing that, replying to every single person in depth and actually trying to help them for free without any expectation of getting anything back, that was massive for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so starting to do that. Um, yeah, th those were those were a couple of the big ones at the time. I'd be interested, I mean, the both of them, I, that's the, the kind of jab, jab, right hook sort of element where you give away loads of value and then and like eventually you might put out a product and someone will buy it because you've helped them out and that's definitely something i've massively taken on board it's just like everything i put out i try and give something of value away for the person people to take when that like for any personal trainer listening like that's just obvious that you I'm should no be brain. doing that yeah and even if they don't buy whatever you put out you get the good feeling and like positive contributing to like society why we do it. yeah exactly, exactly. Um, and then also I thought I actually I've got a question about the time blocking of period like things that you're doing do you now have a like calendar yourself that you time block exactly what you're doing and then it, further on top of that how do you like sometimes do you ever find yourself like what should I do now like do you ever find yourself struggling to find something to do or do you always know what you're going to do because for myself I know sometimes like I'll have some free time I'm like I know I've got loads of things to do but there's so much to do I don't really know kind of what and I don't know how to grasp what I need to do sometimes mm -hmm. so the way I tackle that second piece is scheduling my next day the night before because if I don't I will run into that I know I want to make this piece of content and this but I also have a few emails I need to reply to or should I reply to snaps on snapchat that I've let built up over time mm -hmm. by planning the night before that's what allows me to just Okay, now I have my plan. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I don't use my calendar on my phone like uh, like Gary does, where right. it's all blocked out. What I do use it for is time sensitive obligations. If I have a lunch meeting, if I like anything where I have to be in a specific place at a specific time, you are on my calendar for this podcast. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't put like write for three hours on my calendar. Okay. Uh, I I. I used to, I did daily YouTube uploads for a while and I talked about productivity a lot because that was what I was interested in and what was on my mind. Um, and I haven't figured it out is, is the short answer. Paul Graham's post maker versus manager, which I'll send to you. We can link up like I, it's a short read that I think is really important for anyone, but it, it discusses the difference between a, a creative and a manager's schedule oh, where yeah. cre creatives operate in like half day or full day chunk same with uh um, someone doing like loads of coding work where you need four six eight hour blocks to get in a flow state and feel like you can really crush mm -hmm. versus a manager a delegator someone who does break their schedule into 60 30 15 five minute meetings mm -hmm. um, i just prior to stumbling upon that piece i tried to set my schedule up like that where i'm doing this for this block this for this block throughout the day and i could never get that like good deep work oh, yeah. complete. Um, so now the way my schedule works is wake up. I'm sleeping eight hours a night right now. I've actually, this is on YouTube as well as podcast. So I can, yeah. I can point out that like, I don't know if you can see that I look like I haven't been sleeping, but I actually just started boxing 
and got punched in the face. Oh, nice. so, yeah, yeah. So I have like a giant bruise on the bridge of my nose, which I think is going to be a black eye tomorrow. We'll see. But <laughs> um, sleep eight hours, wake up, emails first. And I know, I think it was like a Tim Ferriss, don't open your inbox until yeah. what, like so many productivity hacks. Yeah. For me, my online coaching clients are the most important thing mm -hmm. that I need to do that I need to take care of. So going into that inbox first thing in the morning and making sure if anyone needs anything, I can take care of them right away. Yeah. Once once I'm done with that, then my day like really starts, um, which might mean filming a video, scripting a video, uh, writing something. I usually get to the gym midday, maybe five or six hours after I wake up. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, I've been very like dialed into my yeah. own training. So leaning out because I need to be lighter for boxing and uh, I'm strength training five days a week and boxing every day. So a, a solid 90 to 120 minutes a day of working out. And then, yeah, sometimes my afternoon falls apart and from 4 PM on I'm not productive. And mm -hmm. sometimes I, I get back in the groove with um, crushing more content. It just, it kind of depends. Yeah. No, I think I, I like that because I think a lot of the time personal trainers, we know we talk about like, a meal plan can make life easier at times when you don't know kind of when you've got little time like you can go to a meal plan or like having a training program is much better than going to the gym and just like not having anything to go to it's just like with business like you could set up a, a basic plan an outline of what you're going to do for your day rather than mm. just being like oh i've got free time now let's hop on here let's do this whereas if you actually like you said like plan the night before and i often say this to my clients who are like dieting like plan your macros the meals you're gonna have the night before make your life easier like the same for business and that's something i i had started to do and i kind of got out of the habit um but your day sounds scarily familiar to mine in that <laughs> i'm very much morning client gym and then it kind of whatever happens happens <laughs> yeah yeah and and i haven't found a way and i don't know that i want to find a way to like squeeze every single hour out of the day mm -hmm. to, to go back to the Gary thing. That was probably one of the not so amazing patterns was I don't want to say comparing myself to him because that just sounds like egotistical and outlandish and like, are you serious? But trying to match that level of output. Um, and then when inevitably failing to do so feeling bad about that, mm -hmm. like that was a real takeaway too. So on days where I take care of my clients, I get a few training programs designed, maybe I get a YouTube uploaded and I get my own workouts in, I circle back through the inbox again in the afternoon. Like some days at this point with where my business is and with where my like personal priorities are, mm -hmm. some days if I don't do work in the evening and just relax, like that's okay. Mm -hmm. And then plan the next day and maybe the next day I do post like a 14 hour work day and, and maybe it's another seven or eight hour work day. No, that's a good position to be in. I guess there's an element of like you're at, you've put in the hard work now, so you can kind of sit back. And I think it's even, it's just if people can relate it to the gym, like you have your hard workouts, you have maybe some lighter workouts to let the like you let that fatigue come down, so you can build up and push again. It's the same mm -hmm. with kind of business and working, I guess, to a degree. Um, in terms of kind of, did Gary teach you any lessons in terms of like social media? And because I know. In the past, you had like your, and actually on Instagram at the moment, you've probably seen there's a huge like onslaught of like calorie comparisons and different infographics. Mm -hmm. And I know that's something you did kind of absolutely ages ago. You did YouTube videos of calorie yeah. comparisons and it's kind of circled its way back round. Are there any kind of, how do you identify the thing that's going to kind of suddenly explode because now like I'm sure these are going to get boring and people are going to try and find something else do you, mm -hmm. do you have any personal ways of doing that or is it just kind of luck of the draw I don't want to call it luck because I think that discredits those who are succeeding at it mm -hmm. um, but I will say that I don't have a way to predict what is going to be viral content like we can call it that based yeah. on the the Instagram uh, growth of like certain people who are crushing those. Um, the way I think about content is make something that helps people. And usually I think about making something that helps a specific person. Cool. So for, for example, uh, right now I have a handful of clients or I guess two or three who 
are early in muscle gain phases and two weeks in, three weeks in, four weeks in, frustrated that they're not seeing change in the mirror. And I need to make a, a good, whether it's an article or a video, but like a sound piece of content that explains, hey, if you're a non-drug using strength trainer in a calorie surplus, here's what's going to happen because you're not going to, it's not like when you cut and eight weeks into a cut, mm -hmm. you can see, oh, I look leaner in the mirror. Like building muscle, you might look worse shirtless yeah. with the body fat that accompanies the, the muscle gain in that process. Um, so like it's, that's how I think about making content. Um, yeah, I wish I had a, a strategy or like a way to think about it or a way to use each platform natively mm -hmm. that, uh, that shared some wisdom that GV imparted on me. It's trying shit, yeah. I guess. Let's go with that. Cause I don't, I don't have a tactic, but I do have a, a, a philosophy, which is mm -hmm. you're not going to know if something's going to pop if you don't make something. And so the fear of putting out that content, kind of like we talked about earlier, but trying new things, yeah. the calorie comparison, the, the light green check red X, the, I'm actually not up to speed on, on most Instagram stuff yeah. right now. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's just doing it and, and paying attention to what people who are doing it well, like yeah. what strategies are they doing and putting your own spin on it. Yeah. I think I think you actually do have a strategy there actually that you identified was that like your clients that you work with now are probably the type of person that you're going to want to work with in future and attract anyway. So if you're answering their questions via content, then you're not just helping them, but you're potentially kind of drawing in the crowd that you want to reach. So that's actually, yeah. I think that's probably a really good way of doing it. I think if I was to say anything about looking at what's doing well in on social media at the moment it's like you said put your own spin on it and if you can make it better make it better because i know your initial calorie kind of comparisons they were really like they're just really good um whereas Thanks. there's there's people doing these things that they're just like you don't even like the picture like it's got it's, it could be the same content it's just not presented well yeah and and that's uh that's an area where talking about being native to the platform and people ask me like what does that mean being native to the platform um it's a marketing term that I picked up from being around Vayner Media and like those smart people so much, which like for Instagram, photo quality is something that is native to the platform. Yeah. If you take a zoomed in blurry picture of your meal, like that's not native Instagram content uh, versus a high quality, like Carter Good is someone who's doing really well at yeah, these calorie comparisons. Um, unbelievable, like human being, but his, the graphics and like the font and the spacing and the pictures are just like, he clearly puts hours into creating them and it mm -hmm. shows because the photo quality, like the content's great, but they get that traction and explore from, Oh, this is like beautiful to look at yeah. as well as helpful. No, I think, yeah, for Instagram, like you just have to think, what is it? It's photos. Most people don't even read the, the blurb. Like they just like it if it looks cool. So they might read it if it looks like interesting. Um, yeah. But, and actually that's a question I have because obviously there's loads of different platforms that you could, a personal trainer could potentially be on. And I know you're kind of prioritizing Snapchat over Instagram stories um, and you're on YouTube. How, let me, or are you? <laughs> let me, let me cut you off. I'm only prioritizing Snapchat because I'm straight up addicted to Instagram. So oh, yes. if, if I open Instagram to post like, here's a fat loss tip, I'm making this smoothie, here are the macros, here's the recipe. If I do that on Snapchat, I just do it right here in my kitchen, four snaps, one minute, boom. If I do that on Instagram, I accidentally end up in the explore tab. <laughs> Next thing I know, I'm laying on my bed, like doing this, and an hour passes. Yeah. And then it's like, wait, I was supposed to be doing something. Like literally, that's why I'm uh, I'm more into Snapchat for making okay. content. But I, I cut you off. I'm sorry. So you, you could be on like any platform. Yeah, just if how do you first of all do it for yourself, and then I guess people can maybe apply that to themselves. Because I'm guessing you don't want to spread yourself too thinly. Um, you, you want to pick kind of appropriate platforms. How do you go about identifying that? Mm, this might be wrong, but it's just honest, and it's what I enjoy and where I feel like my skill set lies. Mm -hmm. So um, if I like. To use a cliche example, Instagram, YouTube, if someone is very, very, very physically attractive versus writing, all else equal. So like decent writer, 
decent speaker, but like not super amazing at either, but just a very attractive dude or woman, I would do something where that is reflected, like mm-hmm. going where your skill set is versus if you are someone who really enjoys having long, deep conversations and like going in on subjects and conversing with other people, um, podcast seems like a really good medium there. Mm-hmm. Like, I just don't think, I think going where the audience is, isn't the best strategy versus going where you should be going yeah. because there's audience everywhere, right? Like there are people who yeah. can Pinterest. I don't know anything about Pinterest. I have a Pinterest account. I don't know anything about it, but guess what? Millions of people use it. And yeah. so like, I, I could be there if I were good at it or if I was into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's an important message because I know I, even for myself I find like I actually enjoy I enjoy Snapchat. Instagram kind of bugged me because they did they did the same thing as is Snapchat, but I enjoy Snapchat. I enjoy taking photos. I enjoy like sharing those images. And as kind of a bodybuilder and trying to chat, attract that sort of person, it's quite important to have that kind of like image. Not that I'm fantastic in amazing shape, but it helps to have that element. And then like I started a blog. I've got the blog and now I've got the podcast and sometimes it does feel overwhelming, but, um, I think you do, you're completely right. I like, if you want to, you need to narrow down and kind of find the things that you can pour value into. And don't be, don't beat yourself up. Not you, but like people don't beat yourself up for not being everywhere Mm -hmm. because it, it can be like, Oh, I can't post in all seven places and be consistent. F it. And, and then you go from like, a thousand to zero versus I'm going to stay in this one or two places and do this really well to start because that's way better than not doing anything. And I guess that's, I mean, we can relate it again back to like training. You don't want to start off training seven days a week or six days a week. You want to start off like two, three days a week, start consistently like smashing that, improving with that. And then you can develop and build and you become more and more advanced. You can kind of, yeah, keep going. So yeah, yeah. The, it, there's, the parallels are just everywhere. Yeah, I don't, I don't really think about them until like you're talking about it, and then I'm, I'm thinking about that element. Um, oh, fits. Yeah. So, in terms of we talked about, and I think this is something very important because we have talked about kind of time management and the fact there are so many different social media platforms, and we talked beforehand about, and we talked about how busy you are and how you need to juggle life and things like that. How how have you managed that? Do you ever I know for myself, and like, if I'm completely honest, I'm a bit obsessed, too obsessed sometimes with my business. And I'll be like, I'll be watching Netflix with my girlfriend and I'll be on my phone looking at something and she'll be like, oh, you're always on your phone. Like, what? we're meant to be watching this together. Do you ever mm-hmm. find yourself doing that? And how do you, have you ever, do you find a strategy of getting around it? How, how do you like talk to people who are close to you and kind of get them to understand or do you just, yeah, how do you, how do you deal with that dynamic? I, I did an atrocious job at it for several years. And I just wasn't that fun of a person to be around. <laughs> and I wasn't engaged and I, I wasn't super present. And mm-hmm. I just didn't spend that much time with other humans in person, friends, dating, like family members. Um, relationships got neglected for business. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not the best person to, to ask. I mean, communication, right? So letting the, the people who are very close to you that have expectations for you and your behavior, let them know that right now, this is massively, massively important to me in my life um, and have that conversation so that they know what to expect. Mm-hmm. Recently, I, I talked before about being on vacation and literally not, oh, yeah. like, not, only, not only not posting, but not even logging into the apps. Um, and taking that all or nothing mindset another direction, that was massively beneficial for me to just spend time with my family in person without the distraction. Um, yeah, I've tried. I've tried a lot of things. I recently, in the last week, I've tried to set social media rules for myself by having a, a 60 or 90 minute window where I'm going to do all of my looking at photos, yeah. catching, catching up with people, replying to DMs and snaps. I'm going to do all that in a window and then the rest of the time I'm not going to do it so I can be present in writing. I can be present in hanging out with this friend. I can be present in my workout rather than being on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, but I haven't, uh, 
I haven't succeeded 100% in that. It's just, it's habit. It's log into yeah. this and look and it's always right there. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't have great advice for balance. Mm -hmm. I, I will go the other direction and this is probably the answer I would have given a year ago when I was more like, I'm growing my business at all costs. This is my biggest priority right now. Um, there isn't balance. Yeah. Like, you need to have periods of your time where you're obsessed with something if you want to dominate that thing. Yeah. I don't know a way to multiply your income, grow following, like, like build a business, build a brand without spending a massive amount of time on the thing. Mm -hmm. And maybe that means just like really, really prioritizing and being self-disciplined. So on Saturdays from 2 p.m. on the rest of the day, that's my time where I'm going to give my significant other like all of my attention yeah. and, and maybe like dinner every night. And, and I don't like that balance is different for everyone, of course, but um, knowing that I'm going to spend loads of time on my business for a year, two mm -hmm. years, like I don't, some amount of time until you're in a position where you're more content and can pull back. No, I think that's a good answer. I think not only good because I think it gives people who are maybe working really hard and understanding that it doesn't have to be forever. And like yourself, like you, you, you did work really hard. Now you've taken a whole week off. And I guess, um, did you, I guess from taking away from that, did you kind of realize that you can do that and your business is still okay? Um, like, is that something you took away from it? Something I took away from it. It, it was, it was a, a solid two weeks with a couple days on the back end of the, the beach trip. Um, I was still in the inbox, right? Okay. So, so I, I probably spent 90 to 120 minutes first thing in the morning when I woke up, have a cup of coffee, do my work, and then get to the beach with the family rest of the day. I'm not doing anything. But yeah, by, oh, I don't need to post content every single day and reply to every single DM and like my business is still alive. Yeah, that, that was definitely a, a takeaway. Mm -hmm. I guess that's similar to like, I mean, if anyone's ever taken a week off the gym, you almost come back stronger, more refreshed, and you don't lose all your muscle, you don't lose all your gains. So yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's just, it is really hard. And like, I know like, if anyone who's obsessed about their business, anyone who's obsessed about like building muscle, their physique, it's hard to take a week off. And it's almost like you have to, it's almost like medicine, you have to just take it. Um, and sometimes I don't know if it was, I'm guessing it wasn't forced upon you, but I know I, the times I've benefited most is sometimes when it's forced upon me like if there's bad connection like i actually see the benefit then because i'm like oh it's forced upon me but it's actually been so nice not to have connection yeah it gives you like the, the opportunity that you might not have created for yourself yeah completely um so i think we're coming to kind of time and i think we've actually touched on loads and loads of elements i don't know if you if you want to add anything else now absolutely do um i was just going to round it yeah, um, I don't have a, a, I guess I will say that it was interesting to me what replaced the time that I spent consuming on social mm -hmm. because I, I found myself falling back into patterns that I was into when I was younger, which is like spending two and three hours deep diving on a single subject, mm -hmm. like lay, laying on the beach and like reading an article and then and then like it was more focused attention yeah. than um scattered attention which is it's social media is unbelievable for business because it's where all of the consumer attention is yeah um but for mike as a, a person backing away from it and and letting my attention go elsewhere uh had a lot of merit and like a lot of upside for my happiness and my mentality and um the way i learn and think about things mm -hmm. it, it's just like i haven't fully fleshed out this idea because it just happened and I'm, I'm still right there but i know for a fact that when i when i would spend four hours a night from midnight till 4 a.m when i was supposed to be studying but i was crushing body recomposition.com and that was what I was doing. I wasn't opening new tabs. I wasn't like, yeah. I was just deep in it. And in the last couple years, my attention is much more scattered. And I can't help but think a lot of it has to do with the way I consume 
mindlessly on my phone. Yeah. And, and so that's just a like general point. Pay attention, like yeah. mindfulness, take a second, feel your breath go into your belly and be like, what am I actually doing right now? And, uh, yeah, just some, something to chew on. No, I thought that's actually really good because I find myself doing, I'll even find myself like I'll be reading an email and then like I'll look on Instagram or I'll even be watching a YouTube video and it might be kind of, I, even the recent ones, I don't know if you've seen, Mass has been released, um, mm -hmm. which is by mm -hmm. Eric Helms, Greg Knuckles and uh, Mike Zodos. And I, even like I'll be watching that and I'll be like, right, I'm going to pause it and go on Instagram. It's like, what? why am I doing, like, at least I'm pausing it because, <laughs> but sometimes I won't even pause it. I'll be listening and then I'll be like, oh, I'm like my attention span just goes. It's mm -hmm. terrible. <laughs> There's things there. There's like interesting things in your feed. There's the, the dopamine hit from, oh, new followers, yeah. likes. Like, like, yeah, it's real. It, it crushes me, actually. Um, <laughs> so, so that's something why I love the podcast and I love hosting it because like with Lyle McDonald, who was on, and I didn't, like, anyone who listens to that podcast, and if you listen to it, I say basically nothing. I just stand there and he just goes. And um, awesome. I wanted to ask questions and I was like, listen, like, it was so tiring because I had to stay like connected and listen to him and take everything in. And I actually find myself learning so much from the podcasts because I can't not kind of know exactly what's going on. I have to keep up with that person. Um, so yeah. that deep kind of attention to stuff is really important and actually something I was going to ask you about and I like to ask kind of people who are like coaches and who aren't maybe researchers themselves but very much like you're evidence-based um, mm -hmm. you keep up like with the content I mean you knew what mass was without me explaining it so yeah um, how do you balance that because I know I find myself like I learn a lot from the, doing the podcast I learn a lot from coaching my own clients and I've got a good ground of like knowledge from body recomposition all the books and things mm -hmm. I've got but kind of keeping up to date I find it hard sometimes to actually put aside like if I probably need to put aside hours of my day to be like this is dedicated like you're listening Research, to mass learning. yeah new things yeah yeah I, for me it's it's following the 10 to 15 people on social media and, and even if I'm not in there, actually going to their page or their blog or whatever and seeing what they've been posting, mm -hmm. um, many of whom you've had on here, like examine.com is another one that yeah. I'll spend a, a decent amount of time on. Um, yeah, but, but I'm in the same boat as you in that I'm, I'm not on top of new current research to the extent I, I could be or that, I'm, that I would be interested in because – it still really does interest me. Mm -hmm. uh, the other side of that coin, though, is most people in the world, what they need isn't like the new cutting edge 1.1 versus 1.125 grams of protein per pound of body weight uh -huh. based on this new study. It's not do you hit the big muscles twice or three times a week to elicit maximum hypertrophy over a period of three years, you gain an extra pound of lean tissue. Like that's not what they need. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like they need the stuff that we already know. Yeah. And uh, it's like, start tracking your food, eat more micronutrient dense foods. Like it's, it's the basic seven to nine things, mm -hmm. strength train, progressive overload, you know, do some aerobic work, be consistent over time. So I like learning because it's the thing I'm most interested in, yeah. training, nutrition. Uh, but on the other side of the coin, I don't think you're necessarily like doing this horrible thing by not spending three hours a day studying the, the newest you know, mm -hmm. no, informa I, information that's coming out in the industry. I think, again, I think there's been so many takeaways, for, and this is what Andrea Valdez from 3DMJ very much said kind of like apart from kind of listening to Eric's stuff and like the stuff they're doing on their podcast and working with their clients she doesn't kind of go out of her way to try and pick every like different person's brain and like there's so many people out there with so much to say I mean even if you look into podcasts like mine there's so many podcasts kind of you need to pick and choose the ones you like like the hosts they bring on good guests and then maybe pick out like a book to read every month or something from an author mm. you know and trust um, I very much am like yourself. I pick kind of like a t list of 10 people. I follow everything they put out. 
There's yeah. normally nothing groundbreaking. I mean, there's never anything groundbreaking now. The main principles we know are set, and we can kind of get results with everyone with those. Yeah. Yep. I'm the, glad other, you... the other thing about following too many people, too, is inevitably you're going to end up with a decent amount of conflicting information yeah. based on which studies they're discussing and just like how those results are being analyzed that yeah there there is such a thing as like consuming too much on that front mm -hmm. yeah i think people get like people get really lost and confused and it, and i think once you have got that yeah we've we've kind of demolished that i can't have, add anything else once you've got the good the, the principles and you know, know your stuff you've helped lots of clients you're almost learning the little details with your clients and how you can help individual people like that's almost a better practical skill than learning kind of a really in-depth research topic or whatever might happen because so much of it is behavioral mm -hmm. it's not it's not like you know your percent daily value of total vitamin a intake over time it's hey like what's going on in your life that is forcing you to eat an average of 3,800 calories a day and like what changes can we make to your lifestyle to bring that number down mm -hmm. so, you, so you start losing weight and becoming healthier. Mm -hmm. and I guess yeah, there's only there's a rare number of studies on that sort of thing where it's like the refeeds, like intimate, like uh, daily fasts and things like that. But mo most of the time, it's strategies you've come up with your client. Um, and that's really, really valuable to take away yourself. So yeah, I will, I'll kind of round up what we've talked about here and I want to make sure, cause we talked about so much that I think is going to be a big value to people listening to this and that kind of the first, the things I think about what we've talked about that people can take away is kind of having confidence in yourself is really important. Um, and kind of, can I throw a plug in? Oh yeah. Yeah. Just because you said confidence, not even a plug, but, uh, this like, Two months ago, on March 1st, having never been punched in the face in 29, almost 30 years of life and like feeling soft and feeling like I wanted to pick up a martial art, yeah. um, starting boxing has done more for my self-confidence and like how I feel about myself on a day-to-day -day basis than anything I've ever wow. done. Anyway, I'll, I'll let you recap <laughs> now. I mean... Uh, and we will let you. We will f make sure people know where to find you. Although we talked about on the regiment uh, beforehand, but obviously, like, yeah. Um, anyway, so yeah, self confidence so important, and kind of, and just going like, you don't need to be perfect. Like we talked about at the end as well, like knowing your research and things like that. You don't have to have the perfect article. If you can put out some content that's going to help people, that people are going to kind of relate to, just put it out there. You've got nothing to lose. Um, totally and I, I totally agree it doesn't yeah it doesn't have to be perfect the perfect camera all of those things um, just actually getting content out is very important and then you can make it perfect like at the stage you're at now I'm like the stuff you put out has to, like needs to be high quality and you appreciate that yeah um, <laughs> and then I, I, I don't know why I waited for you to kind of come in on that I was like you like it is high quality right <laughs> <laughs> um, and then just the fact you you have people need to realize they have more time in their day and that having just like plenty of day ahead is all you need to do and having some sort of structure is going to help you so so much um, mm -hmm. I think just taking those points away for anyone who is kind of coming into the industry but also realizing that there is like lots of time in the day but you do need to work very hard for periods of time if you really want growth and then once you put in that background of work, you might not, and I'm sure you're the same, you might not have got a lot of likes when you first started going out. You might not have got loads of followers, but you, you build. Um, no one starts out kind of at the top. You have to build things up. And then, yeah, opportunities arise where you might not even expect them. Mm-hmm, 100%. Awesome. Well, I will thank you, Mike, for coming on and just conversing yeah, with me. It's been a good chat and... Um, this was really fun. <laughs> Good. Thank you for having me, seriously. No, 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 no worries at all. Um, and I'm sure people are going to take a lot of value away from this. And if they want to find more from you, where's kind of the best places they can find you, Mike? My, my website, ontheregimen.com. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you can reach my email address is my name, michaelvacanti at gmail. If, uh, if you want to drop me a note and tell me how much I sucked <laughs> on this podcast or uh, just say hi.
<laughs> and uh, Mike gets back to every email, as you now know. So you can bombard him with as many emails as possible. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'll, time I do. <laughs> I'll make sure we at least have on the regimen will definitely be in the description box below. Um, and I, I do recommend people have a look at the website and follow you on Snapchat. At least those two platforms are the ones I found most on and I've kind of taken lots of value away from. So I think, yeah, the audience will take value away from there. So yeah, cheers, Mike, and cheers to everyone for listening in.